All right, welcome back, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, being ready to go on time. Our next panel is Safe Transportation of Hazardous Materials, and it will be moderated by Captain Scott Schwartz, who is also an MD-11 FedEx Express pilot. Scott and I have known each other for uh, probably longer than we'd both like to remember, but it's only lately that I've come to learn uh, of the seemingly bottomless depth of knowledge that he brings to the issue of safe transportation of hazardous materials, <coughs> and especially for lithium batteries. Um, I've been looking forward to this panel for some time now, and uh, even more so now that there's recent news on the topic of hazardous materials. So, uh, Scott? Thank you very much. Uh, Captains Canole, Huey, Mooney, and Pete have already covered in a broad brush some of the issues that we're going to talk about today, but hopefully we can summarize them and put some of them into a very poignant perspective. Uh, for example, one of the previous panelists made the comment that the danger from lithium batteries are the ones you don't know about. Hopefully by the end of the discussion today, that idea will be totally erased from your mind. So good morning, and let me begin by setting a standard for our conversation today. Some people use the word hazmat, others use the word dangerous goods. For the subject, or for the purpose of today, those two words will be synonymous. So there's no distinction between the two. Also, I'd like to be clear that most of the discussion today will be on the topic of lithium batteries shipped with other batteries, not lithium batteries shipped in or with equipment, especially when we're talking about some of the regulatory issues that affect the conversation and the subject. While our panel title today covers all dangerous goods, recent hazardous material conversation has been dominated by the subject of lithium batteries. Why? Lithium batteries are ubiquitous. There are now billions, that's billions with a B, of cells and batteries shipped by air every year. The desire for mobile power means that these numbers will only increase in the future. Many of us do not realize how ubiquitous lithium batteries are. It's a long list of products, but they are used in laptops, tablets, cameras, power tools, smoke detectors, cars, and almost every other type of portable electronic device imaginable. The second part of the lithium battery story is the unique hazard they pose to commercial aviation. Unlike other flammable materials that are allowed in air transport, lithium batteries contain everything needed to initiate and sustain a fire. When some short circuit, they can go into thermal runaway. The electrical energy they store is converted to heat, which can be conducted to adjacent cell or cells, causing them to short circuit and in turn heat up. In the case of a lithium ion battery, it can result in the venting of flammable gases, which can catch fire or in some cases concentrate into explosive mixtures. In the case of a lithium metal battery, the escaping metallic lithium in flammable gases can result in a fire. In this manner, a single short circuit in a single battery can propagate from cell to cell and from package to package. It's important to note that none of these hazards are reliably mitigated by the commercial aircraft fire suppression equipment or procedures currently used in commercial aviation. So think about what I just said. One single cell shorting and going into thermal runaway can propagate through an entire package or between packages of cells. One single short circuit can lead to the loss of an aircraft if it is packaged in a high density shipment. One single cell. We define a high density shipment as one that if the shipment was to catch fire could overwhelm the fire suppression capability of the aircraft. Recent Federal Aviation Administration experiments show that vented gas from as few as three to eight of the most common types of lithium ion cells can cause an explosion that renders ineffective the fire suppression systems installed on commercial aircraft and can lead to the loss of that aircraft. This means that as few as three to eight lithium ion cells 
can constitute a high-density shipment. Current regulations place no limit on the number of batteries and cells that could be loaded in a shipping container or on an aircraft. As a result, ALPA is calling for the ban of lithium batteries on all commercial aircraft until safer methods of transport are developed and implemented. The FAA experiments I referred to illustrate as well the importance of ensuring that lithium battery shipments are protected from fires originating outside the package. The presence of either lithium metal or lithium ion batteries can radically change the nature of an existing fire. With a lithium battery in a mix, a fire that can be suppressed by onboard systems can quickly become a fire that overwhelms them. The energy density of lithium batteries is growing every year. This trend demands more precise cell design and manufacturing technology because smaller and smaller defects can cause the cells to short circuit and go into thermal runaway. Shorts can be caused by manufacturing defects, thermal shock due to exposure to higher low temperatures, over or undercharging, or mechanical damage. Thermal runaway can occur weeks or even months after a damaging event. And very often, there are no visible signs that damage has occurred. The United States National Transportation Safety Board recognized the dangers posed by lithium batteries as early as 1999. In that year, a pallet of lithium batteries caught fire at Los Angeles International Airport after a Northwest Airlines, Northwest Airlines airplane had arrived from Osaka. In its report on the incident, the NTSB stated that lithium batteries likely present a serious fire hazard to air transportation requiring immediate action. Since then, there have been dozens of fires involving lithium batteries on or near commercial aircraft. In 2009, a consignment of lithium-powered e-cigarettes caught fire on a FedEx airplane on approach to Minneapolis. Fortunately, there were no injuries to the crew. In 2011, lithium batteries about to be loaded on an Austrian Airlines flight caught fire only 20 minutes before departure time. In these two incidents, the result could have been catastrophic had the timing of the fires been only slightly different. As has been discussed earlier, there have been three hull losses of all cargo aircraft carrying significant numbers of lithium batteries in the last 10 years. In the first UPS 1347 in Philadelphia in 2006, the aircraft caught fire on approach, but the crew managed to land and evacuate the airplane safely. In 2010, UPS 6 crashed in Dubai, and the next year, Asiana 991 was lost off the coast of Korea. Unfortunately, the pilots in those accidents perished. In each of these accidents, significant numbers of lithium batteries were loaded near the location where the fire took place. While the accident investigation reports indicated the fires were of unknown origin, there is ample evidence that lithium batteries likely caused or significantly contributed to these accidents. The list of regulators and industry organizations highlighting the hazards and mandating or recommending mitigation is growing. The FAA banned cargo shipments of lithium metal batteries on passenger airplanes in 2004, and ICAO followed suit at the beginning of this year. The National Transportation Safety Board, the FAA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, ICAO, along with Boeing, Airbus, and international aircraft and equipment manufacturer and supplier organizations have all recognized the threats to commercial aviation from the transport of lithium batteries, and they have called for mitigating action. Almost all of these organizations have called for risk assessments to be carried out by airlines that intend to carry lithium batteries. 
In order to perform a risk assessment, the number and type of batteries aboard an aircraft must be known. Since the regulations that apply to most lithium battery shipments don't include many of the protections afforded ordinary dangerous goods shipments, including a dangerous goods declaration, it is difficult for airlines to track the flow of these batteries through their system. As a result, it is nearly impossible for airlines to perform a proper risk assessment, and pilots rarely know how many lithium batteries are aboard their aircraft. In the Dubai accident, for example, more than 80,000 lithium batteries were on board the aircraft, but none were listed on the notification to the pilot. In addition, these shipments were not required to have UN specification packaging or training for the personnel handling them. No acceptance check is required when the batteries are presented to an operator for transport. While non-standard markings may be present, the normal dangerous goods hazard labels are not required. These are all exceptions to normal dangerous goods handling procedures. Last week at the ICAO Dangerous Goods Panel meeting, IFALPA proposed a ban on lithium-ion battery shipments on passenger aircraft. The ban was supported by the FAA, ICCAIA, which is a manufa uh, aircraft manufacturing, suppliers, and parts trade organization, and Boeing. While it was not approved by the ICAO Dangerous Goods Panel, it is important to note that the proposal was supported by regulatory bodies around the world, a major organization representing the largest airframe manufacturers in the world, and the Global Pilots Organization. Additionally, more than 30 airlines worldwide have stopped accepting lithium-ion battery shipments. And this includes both cargo and passenger carriers. In this case, it's safe to say that airlines are leading the regulators in advancing air safety. To be clear, there are no regulatory limits to the number of lithium ion batteries that may be loaded on commercial aircraft worldwide, and no limit to the number of lithium metal batteries that may be loaded on cargo aircraft. This is the current regulatory standard. To mitigate these significant threats, measures must be taken to ensure that batteries are designed and manufactured to quality standards that ensure that their risk of shorting is minimized. The integrity of the supply chain has to be protected so that only legally manufactured and shipped batteries are transported in commercial aviation. Batteries must be packaged in such a way that any fires or vented gases are contained within the package. Batteries must be loaded in cargo containers so that any fire or explosion that does not exit the package is confined to the cargo container. And cargo containers must be loaded on aircraft in a manner to make certain that a fire in a container will not overwhelm the fire suppression system. This will require a coordinated effort among manufacturers, shippers, operators, regulatory agencies, airframe manufacturers, aviation industry parts and service providers. ALPA is working hard to help lead the industry effort that must take place to effectively safeguard air transportation. Our panel today is a great example of this effort. Our first panelist is Mr. Gus Sarkos, manager of the Fire Safety Branch of the Federal Aviation Administration, William J. Hughes Technical Center. Thank you for coming, and it's your microphone. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> Let me just go back. Okay. My uh, presentation will be an overview of the tests that we've conducted on lithium ion batteries and thermal runaway to measure the hazards of the flammable gases produced by these batteries in an aircraft cargo compartment. Uh, much of this work that I'll be presenting has been work that was completed in the last year or so. The outline of my presentation is basically a summary of 
a number of test series. Thermal runaway propagation and packaging, the effect of a fire-hardened container when you have a shipment of lithium batteries involved in a fire, large shipment of dense shipment of lithium batteries, an examination of the flammable gases that are produced by lithium ion batteries in thermal runaway, the effectiveness of halon, which is the fire extinguishing agents used in commercial transport fire suppression systems on preventing a lithium ion flammable gas explosion, uh, an attempt to determine the quantity of gas and the equivalent number of batteries that if ignited would cause the pressure relief panels on an airplane, which are designed to prevent a pressure differential between the cargo compartment and the cabin in the event of the depressurization of the cargo compartment. And of course, a summary of findings. Uh, early on in our experiments, one of the first things we discovered was that, as Scott uh, discussed previously, a single cell in thermal runaway will cause the remaining cells to also enter in thermal, way, uh, thermal runaway until the entire package is consumed by thermal runaway. The way we create the thermal runaway is to use a cartridge heater, replace one battery, put the cartridge heater in, that simulates the heat from a defective cell, and that initiates the, the, pack, the thermal runaway. Also, we determined that halon was ineffective in preventing the thermal runaway propagation. The halon will extinguish any fire that can be caused, but it doesn't have the cooling capabilities, which is the key if you're trying to prevent thermal runaway by using some type of suppression system. Next is tests that we conducted in a fire-hardened container. Uh, this fire-hardened container was developed by a major freighter operator. It's an excellent container in terms of uh, suppressing or extinguishing fires, which are uh, dominated by non-lithium batteries or common cargo. But we wanted to determine, and the, and the operator wanted to determine what uh, effectiveness this container might have against a fire that was dominated by lithium batteries. So we took a shipment of 5,000 lithium batteries. This is the way we receive them. This is an example of what are called class two batteries. These are batteries that consist of either nine cells in a box or two ba batteries in a box that do not require declaration and can be exempted from uh, being declared. Those batteries can be shipped in unknown quantities, in large quantities, without notification of the carrier. And that's exactly the way we receive them, and that's exactly the way we stowed them in the container. You can see it doesn't take up much space in the rear of the container. This is... Uh, on some more photos of the container, the, it has a suppression system. It's what's called a pyrotechnically activated aerosol fire suppression system. Uh, the rest of the cargo container was filled with uh, boxes and then, and then the uh, door was closed. This is a video of the uh, results of that test. We replicated the test. In the first test, the fire suppression system was not activated due to imp improper detection algorithm, but in the second test it was, and you will see this during the test. We're 24 minutes into the test. The smoke that you see coming out of the seams is when the fire suppression system was activated that additional mass into the container, which is fairly airtight, not completely airtight, obviously, 
pushes out the smoke and the gas inside the container. This test is conducted in our full-scale fire test facility, which enables us to conduct very controlled experiments uh, in an environment that's uh, very safe. 42 minutes into the test, so you had a very serious explosion. That explosion was caused by the buildup of flammable gases that can accumulate from lithium ion batteries and thermal runaway. So we wanted to get a handle of the composition and quantity of the gases produced by lithium ion batteries. So we did controlled experiments in a small sphere which was designed to uh, create and collect the gases in a highly controlled manner. And these are the results of our tests, and this is very important data. It shows a plot from the left to the right of total hydrocarbons, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and total gas as a function of state of charge. So you can see a number of important trends. One is that the quantity of gases is a strong function of state of charge. And particularly at 50% and above, the state of charge uh, causes, a higher state of charge causes quite an increase in gas volume produced. The quantity of gas produced is very large. If you look at the plot on the right, total gas volume at 100% state of charge is eight liters. If you look at the second plot, hydrogen, the volume of hydrogen produced at 100 state of charge is 1.5 liters. This is the battery that we tested. It's a very common type of cylindrical rechargeable battery, lithium cobalt dioxide. The volume of hydrogen gas produced at 100%, if you calculate the volume of this cylinder, is 90 times the volume of that cylinder. So the quantities are very large. The next series of tests were conducted to determine the effect of this halon in preventing the ignition of the vented gases. Halon 1301 is the fire extinguishing agent used in cargo compartment fire suppression systems, class C cargo compartments. These systems are designed for an initial discharge of 5% to extinguish any fires, and then a metering concentration of 3% to suppress the fire for the duration of the fire, or the duration of the flight. So this type of suppression system is very effective against non-lithium type batteries. So we conducted the test in a 10.8 cubic meter chamber. That's a pressure vessel we have. That volume is within the range of volumes of aircraft cargo compartments. And we tested a large number of batteries similar to the previously described experiments where we triggered thermal runaway with a single cartridge heater. Once all the cells had been driven into thermal runaway, we then introduced the halon and spark and had a sparking electrode as an ignition source and the pressure rise was recorded. So this is a plot of the pressure rise in that vessel as a function of time for three conditions. On the left, no suppression. So you see a rapid rise in pressure, almost 80 PSI peak. With 5.3% halon, which is slightly above the extinguishing concentration, there is a 
high pressure rise, not quite what you got without suppression, but very close of about 70 PSI. At 10.4%, which is twice the design concentration, we're able to prevent the ignition of the flammable gases. The flammable gas mixture is, has a very large uh, concentration of hot hydrogen. Hydrogen is unusual compared to the other flammable hydrocarbon gases that can be produced in that it has a wide flammability range. It can be ignited at a very low ignition energy. But more importantly, the concentration of halon that is required to prevent an explosion is much, much higher than the other type of flammable gases. Uh, we have just conducted, we are conducting experiments now to, to pin that number down. It, uh, it was reported at a recent <coughs> systems meeting that was held several weeks ago in um, Atlantic City. And if you just had a mixture of halon, that minimum concentration, I should say the minimum inerting concentration for any hydro hydrogen mixture is in the neighborhood of about 28%, whereas the other hydrocarbons are usually in the neighborhood of 5 to 10%. There has been a lot of discussion on what is a dense shipment of lithium batteries. It's clear that when you have a package of lithium batteries, that's a dense shipment because you have one battery next to another, next to another. So we wanted to try to determine what would be the minimum number under the worst case conditions where you had the flammable gases in a pocket and then that pocket was ignited. So we did these tests in our 737 cargo compartment with a 70% loading of cargo. So the actual free space in that compartment was, you know, approximately 100 cubic feet or so. So this is the results of these tests. Uh, if you're not, I would imagine most of you are familiar with this, but just might be worth reiterating. These pressure relief panels, as I mentioned earlier, are designed to prevent a differential pressure between the cargo compartment and the cabin that could suck down the floor. In 1974, a Turkish Airways DC-10 experienced that type of failure. And when that accident occurred, it was the most catastrophic commercial airline accident in aviation. There were 345 people killed in that accident. So airplanes are designed to relieve pressure at a fairly low pressure differential to prevent that type of failure. So this is a plot of pressure rise versus number of 18650 cells with a 50% state of charge. So the results of these experiments are very specific to the conditions that we tested at, which is a small cargo compartment, 70% loaded with these type of batteries. The panels, we were told, are designed to relieve pressure between one half and one PSI. So the results that we got are very consistent with what was reported to us by the manufacturers. On the left, at a little bit over 0.2 PSI, the pressure release panel was not opened. At a little bit above 0.6 PSI, the pressure release panel was open, and at 1.2 PSI, it was open severely. So this is very consistent, our results in terms and what the manufacturers reported in terms of the pressures required to open 
the pressure relief panels. Now cargo compartments are designed to remain intact during a fire. If the cargo compartment is not intact, then the fire protection capability will be diminished. You can have agent leaking out, you can have air leaking in, and even smoke and gases spreading to other parts of the airplane. These experiments were conducted in the last three or four months. So in summary, a bulk shipment of lithium-ion batteries and thermal <clears throat> runaway may cause an explosion in a fire-hardened container, which is very capable of suppressing or even extinguishing non-lithium battery cargo fires. In fact, in one experiment, we initiated a fire in that container with packaging that was not lithium batteries, and it prevented the fire from spreading to a package of lithium batteries. Lithium-ion batteries and thermal runaway can produce large quantities of flammable gases. Most importantly, hydrogen, a variety of other hydrocarbons, and also carbon monoxide. And also that the production of these gases is a strong function of state of charge. And it increases particularly uh, significantly above 50%. And as we showed, the design concentration of a halon extinguishing system in an aircraft, which is 5%, is incapable of preventing the ignition of the flammable gases produced by lithium ion batteries and thermal runaway. And finally, the ignition of flammable gases produced by a small number of lithium batteries and thermal runaway, just a handful. And of course, this will depend on the number of parameters, state of charge, the type, the chemistry of the battery, the size of the cargo compartment, et cetera. But it can, can cause an overpressure, which will activate the pressure release uh, panels and compromise the fire protection capabilities in that cargo compartment. So that's a summary of uh, some of the work that we've done recently on lithium ion batteries. I, I would want to point out one thing. Uh, that the measurements that we made on um, the flammable gases produced by lithium batteries is consistent with that of other independent researchers that have been documented in terms of the quantities of the gases produced, the significant uh, proportion of hydrogen in those gases, and those in independent researchers do include Exponent Incorporated in the U.S. and the University of Graz in Austria. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarkos. Next, we have Captain Rudy Canto. Captain Canto is the Senior Director of Safety, Security, and Technical Affairs at Airbus Americas. Go ahead. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> And uh, thank you for your fine introduction to the topic. Covered a lot of things that I'll be covering as well. And uh, Gus, you have set the stage marvelously for some of the things that I will be covering in a high level. Uh, and uh, so this issue of transporting of uh, lithium ion batteries is something that we take very seriously at Airbus. But by and large, we're limited as to what we can do depending on regulators and the requirements. Uh, by the regulate, re regulating authorities. So if we take a snap, if we go back in time <clears throat> with regards to uh, uh, certification specifications by EASA and the FAR certification of Part 25, 857, they're 75 years old. And back then, it was thought, and I quote, the extent and seriousness of experience with Class A fires and aircraft, especially in flight, have been so rare as to contribute only slightly to the overall safety hazards of aviation. This is back in the 40s. Based on this low estimation of risks balanced against cost of the system and especially the severe penalty of its weight, fire extinguishing was considered impractical. 
So that's when these regulations were developed, and we're still living with them today. So in a Class A fire, back then, they were designed for minimal things that were on carried cloth, paper, etc. Class A fires. There was no consideration to flammable liquids, uh, combustible metals, lithium-ion batteries, lithium batteries. So that's where we are today. So the requirements for shipping dangerous goods, as we all know, are specified in the technical specifications, technical instructions of IKL, Annex 18, and IATA dangerous goods regulations. Those are the two that are primary today. So we have three aspects of cargo compartment fire protection, as those defined by IKO and IATA and the dangerous goods uh, working panel. And then it comes down next to protecting the outside of the compartment from internal hazards created by a fire and controlling the fire in the compartment through a combination of active and passive means. And this is within the scope of the OEM. But the OEMs are restricted as to what they can do as a function of the regulatory uh, certification requirements. So just to go back in the Class C, as was mentioned earlier, passive protection, talked about full lining, cargo liners, smoke barriers. We have the smoke detectors, and they're qualified, as Gus mentioned, for five minutes under control with active protection, smoke and fire detection, ventilation, and with fire suppression system designed for fire loads using HALON. And I was pointed out several times this morning that a lithium battery fire that's uncontained has a potential to defeat the cargo compartment fire protection systems as they exist today. Moving on to Class C compartments, passive protection, shielding of essential systems, smoke barriers, again qualifying for within five minutes, active protection, including smoke and fire detection and ventilation shutoff, no fire suppression procedure based on oxygen starvation. Again, if a lithium battery fire is uncontained, it can defeat the cargo compartment fire protection system. So as, we, as we've mentioned, the regulations, when it comes to lithium ion batteries, seem to fall short. But then it's responsibility of the operators for the, to ensure everything they can do to be sure to limit that dangerous aspect. But from our position as an OEM, all we can do basically do is support the cast efforts, participate to the various GIMDATs and JSAT working groups, support IATA, if ALPA, IKO, ALPA, the uh, dangerous, IKO dangerous uh, goods panel, and the International Coordinating Council to address these risks. We fully support the efforts by the operators to conduct, conduct full risk assessments and to uh, review the mitigation guidance prior to carrying lithium ion batteries, and everybody is doing that marvelously and also to reviewing high levels of methods of packaging and shipment of lithium-ion batteries. So from the Airbus perspective, we need to comply with the EASA and FA certification standards. The type of certif certification document for an A330, as an example, lists those items that are required for a passenger airplane and a cargo airplane of approximately 1,000 A330s in revenue service today, there's only 30 cargo freighters as such. Obviously, when we go to A300s, A310, there's a, a large more number of freight operators on the order of about 300. And most of those operations were converted under STCs. So what we've done is we have limited capability, but we try and publish on our Airbus world service information letters regarding transport of dangerous goods, which basically highlights and reinforces everything that industry has been saying. We have a flight operation briefing notes for the pilots. And I just came from a technical conference in Dublin last week, and where they shared a uh, emergency procedure 
for lithium battery, battery, lithium ion battery fire in the cockpit. And this was for A330s. We'll be developing one, developing one for the A300 and A310 as well. And so it's because, as we all know, as was mentioned, the number and quantity of lithium ion batteries in any given flight deck can be anywhere, anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 batteries. And there's nothing to say that something's not gonna happen right in our immediate environment. And in a passenger airplanes, when you have 200 passengers, multiply that out by the number of devices on board, you can have in excess of 1,000 lithium ion, ion batteries in the aircraft. So we will continually work with industry actively uh, to define the best means to mit mitigate the risks posed by lithium ion batteries. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Captain Canto. Our final panelist is Mr. Stefan Rossetti, Senior Manager of Logistics and Supply Chain at Medtronic Corporation. He is speaking on behalf of the Medical Device Battery Transport Council. Mr. Rossetti. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you uh, to the Airline Pilot Association for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak on this panel. Um, I will be specifically speaking about the Medtronic's development uh, of lithium batteries and the efforts uh, that our company is taking in an, uh, to ensure the safe transport of these batteries on aircrafts. I also uh, wanted to mention that this presentation is on behalf of Medtronic and the MDBTC, uh, which stands for uh, the Medical uh, Device Battery Transport Council. Now, I've heard a lot of compelling stories and really good stories about safety and threat uh, caused by lithium batteries. Th this is true. But uh, I will talk about the lithium batteries that are here to save lives. And we'll get into that in, in my presentation. Uh, sorry, just, oh, sorry. Thank you. Quick agenda. Uh, I will be, as I said, focusing mainly on the uh, lithium uh, batteries for medical devices and the safety of these lithium batteries. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the design and R&D, uh, and I'll also will focus on the shipping operations. A quick presentation of our company. Uh, Medtronic is a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions. And more precisely, our products alleviate pain, restore health, or extend the life of two patients around the world every second. And some of these products are actually life-saving implantable medical devices, such as pacemakers, neurostimulators, and defibrillators using lithium batteries. As a general opening statement, let me say that Medtronic and the MDBTC do recognize the potential hazards associated with uh, lithium cells and batteries. And because we do understand these risks very well, we do account for these factors when we design our products. So today, my presentation will be focusing mainly on safety and reliability of the medical uh, batteries, or the batteries for medical devices, due to the highest standard and the highest quality in development, design, manufacturing, and packaging. Uh, and now I think we will be playing a, a short video of uh, the manufacturing facility where we do manufacture those lithium batteries. Medtronic Energy and Component Center, MECC, in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. It is a huge operation with 1,200 employees and one single focus. Quality, quality is our critical, very important part, and we want to make sure uh, everything we send it is 100% quality. MECC has received several Medtronic Star of Excellence awards, the company's highest recognition for excellence in quality and compliance. And then we have the second weld here on the end of the To line. understand why quality is so important, you only need to understand what they make the inner workings of many of Medtronic's most complex devices. 
In climate-controlled clean rooms, every aspect of the production process is carefully monitored, constantly tested, continually adjusted to make sure every one of the 17 and a half million components that pass through here every year is as durable and reliable as it can possibly be. Thank you. Uh, moving to the safety of lithium batteries for medical devices uh, and a few words around the regulatory framework. Here in the US, we are regulated by uh, 21 CFR. It's the FDA and more specifically around uh, the medical devices and the quality management systems that we have to have around uh, the manu manufacturing of uh, medical devices. We also follow uh, ISO standard 13485. Uh, 13485 is specifically uh, for medical devices and uh, their components. And um, uh, lithium batteries are actually considered a component of a uh, medical device. Now, 13485 will not tell you how to design or how to manufacture a lithium battery. But 13485 will impose strict development design rules which assure the safety and the reliability of the batteries. And the results documenting uh, the testing of these rules are audited by the FDA or other uh, agencies during the development stage. So development stage is not in production yet. Uh, a few words around the, the battery power. Uh, regarding the uh, low and medium power uh, used in pacemakers and neurostimulators, there is no concerns as the power generated by these uh, batteries is insufficient uh, to generate a thermal runaway event. However, for high power batteries, uh, there are some specific design rules around those. And these are, for example, example uh, heat control. It's really important to understand how heat is generated and where heat is located in the battery in order to mitigate for those risks. And that's what we do. And the second uh, is a shutdown mechanism uh, at a temperature uh, during shorting that is not capable of causing thermal runaway. You have to understand that these batteries will have uh, or will be implanted in someone's body. So we have to manufacture them, we have to design them in a very safe way. Uh, UN testing 38.3, um, every manufacturer has to go through those. Uh, they are designed uh, for transportation safety. We do ours during the development stage. We do document them and, and uh, keep them in a control uh, quality management system. A few points around the supply chain control. Uh, within the medical technology world, uh, we have to control the whole supply chain. And it starts with our raw materials. They are defined by uh, product specification. And those product specifications, they are passed on to our suppliers. We do qualify our suppliers. Uh, and we do audit them regularly. It's part of what we have to do and it's part of what it's uh, 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 controlled by uh, 21 CFR and other, uh, other government agencies. Even though we do receive uh, components from qualified suppliers, they still would go to, through an incoming inspection process. And then they would be released or acceptable for production. Around uh, manufacturing controls, uh, as you've seen in, on the video, um, uh, we are operating in a climate controlled environment. We have traceability systems uh, that control our manufacturing processes. And most of those uh, manufacturing steps are followed by some type of inspections. We do have visual inspections, mechanical inspections, electrical inspections, so that happens throughout the manufacturing process. As a matter of fact, it's been counted that about 1,500 tests will be done throughout the manufacturing of the complete uh, implantable device. 
Uh, we're using uh, validated equipment. Uh, these are actually um, uh, maintained by certified engineers uh, that have a specific uh, training plan as well. Um, and one thing that we are very, very careful about is the metal uh, particulate controls. And this, in order to prevent from foreign materials, and especially foreign metal materials, to enter the battery, as this is a, one of the leading cause of undesired event. So, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, every single cell, and you will see that later in a, in, a, in a picture that I have, every single cell is tested for defect prior to shipment. As a, as a summary, uh, we do have 40 years of experience in designing, manufacturing, and shipping lithium batteries. We ship well over a million batteries every year. And that, the third one here, the 31, uh, speaks to me very uh, loud and, and clear. Every 31 seconds, a Medtronic device containing a lithium battery is implanted. So think about it this way. Uh, during the course of this panel, about 145 patients will receive the therapy they need to save their lives or enhance their lives. Um, and in green, uh, zero transportation incident, and this track record is due to the safety of our batteries, but also, also being in compliance with the current transportation regulations. Um, such as DOT, the Department of Transportation, ICAO, uh, and IATA. So the two key takeaways from this slide are our batteries are safe to be implanted in someone's body. They are safe for transport. And our mission as a medical technology company is to save lives, not to put anyone at risk. And this is including our transportation partners. A few words on the training plan. Um, everything has to be uh, controlled by a quality management system. Uh, we do um, train on IATA and DOT as per the regulations or the requirement of the regulations every uh, two years and three years. Uh, but our HAZMAT employer certification is done on a yearly basis and it is also controlled by our quality management system. Our shipping procedures, we do follow uh, very detailed step-by-step uh, -step instructions and our hazmat shippers are trained on these um, uh, procedures on a yearly basis as well. Our classification process. Now it's, it's a very important process in here. We do classify all new items or new batteries or new product that, uh, that we ship uh, very early on. It is um, um, a, a, a process that is website uh, controlled. Um, and we go through a complex uh, product information transportation sheet, which is our documentation record. And from there, we actually generate a TID, which is a transportation instructions document that you can see on the upper uh, picture. And these are uh, the documents, these TIDs are the documents that the hazmat shippers are following in order to, sh uh, to ship uh, these batteries or any other dangerous goods very safely. <coughs> Talking about the UN classification, uh, when we look at it, we only have four entries, uh, specifically uh, two for bulk. We have the UN 3090 uh, and the UN 3480. Um, and six packing instructions going with that. Um, it might not be sufficient. And as a matter of fact, uh, the MDBTC is currently working on a, a, a project or a proposal uh, to add a new UN number specifically around lithium batteries for medical devices. Our packing, packing or packaging. Um, this is another area where we differentiate ourselves from other manufacturers. And as you can see on the two pictures on the top, our batteries are very well segregated and the terminals are protected to prevent short. Um, also, we pack our batteries on 
average by a lot of only 30 units per inner trade. And we strongly believe that this is a mitigating factor in, in, in terms of transportation risks. Now, the batteries that you see in there uh, uh, are, are rather large. We also have very small batteries that are now directly implanted in the heart. This one here would actually be enclosed in a device that would be um, implanted in the chest, but we do have smaller batteries and smaller pacemakers that are actually going directly in the heart. So you do understand that uh, these batteries are extremely safe uh, by design. Um, the point I wanted to make also on this uh, slide here that is that the, beside the fact that they're very well segregated, they lay in uh, individual pockets, and uh, those pockets are there to prevent shifting during transportation. Now we're equally in, now looking into uh, preventing and preserving the, the lithium battery during transportation as we are to uh, you know, uh, meet the criteria for the uh, uh, the transportation regulations. Also, uh, another point is, and this is why we go above and beyond the current regulations, uh, the 1.2 meter drop test that is mandated or required to do at the package level, we're actually doing it at the inner packing uh, level. So we ensure that nothing will actually move and it will preserve the integrity of the batteries. Uh, the two pictures on the, on the bottom are actually the UN certified cardboard boxes that we're using, and these are actually on the, uh, they have to be um, uh, controlled and recertified uh, every two years. Marking and labeling. Um, it really depends on the, the, the battery, the type of the battery, and the number of batteries that you're, you're shipping. But the point that I wanted to make uh, with this slide here is that Medtronic decided to ship fully declared shipment. That's something that we go also above and beyond uh, the regulations. Although we have many batteries that would be possibly shipped under Section 2 or Section 1B, we took the decision to, take, uh, to, to ship those batteries as 1A only. And for two, mainly for two reasons. The first one is uh, it actually streamlines our shipping processes, but it also, and I think that this panel would be very uh, uh, pleased to hear that, is that uh, Section 1A uh, provides that notification to the carrier. And when there is a notification to the carrier, there is a notification to the pilot. And we strongly believe that the pilot needs to know what, what is on their aircraft. Access to information, all our uh, records are actually uh, scanned and, and published on our website. Everyone can have, have a look, uh, everyone within Medtronic, uh, that is. And we keep all our shipping documentation, again, scanned in our uh, quality management system as well. Around safe transportation operations. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about that, but definitely the multi-layer approach is something I think that this panel will be uh, speaking about in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, definitely uh, all actors need to be involved. Uh, it's not only a transporter, it's not only a pilot, it's not only an aircraft uh, problem, it is uh, large and everyone needs to participate. And that needs to be based on risk assessment. Now, a few words on the Medical uh, Device Battery Transport Council. Uh, the MDBTC consists of medical technologies companies that are uh, manufacturing and distributing life-saving and life-enhancing medical devices and the batteries that power them. Our council is actively working with regulators and other safety advocates to identify risk reduction opportunities as it relates to transportation. But also, the goal of the MDBTC is to ensure that our medical products and their batteries can be delivered to hospitals and patients anywhere around the world in a timely manner. Some goals and objectives of the MDBTC, definitely working towards enhancing safety of lithium battery transport. We want to educate the regulators and the transportation partners on the differences between lithium batteries used in medical devices and the other consumer goods batteries. 
We do support and we do encourage more enforcement of the current regulations by the appropriate authorities, as we do believe that this is a key component of risk reduction. We want to avoid further restrictions, and this is for mainly two reasons. Um, the first one, this will have a negative impact on public health and a potential increase of undeclared shipments by unscrupulous shippers. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the MDBTC will also propose a new UN entry and packing instructions specific to lithium batteries for medical devices. Quick summary in here, I'm not going to go through the whole slide in here, but uh, this, uh, this is a summary of uh, my presentation about the design, the safety, uh, and training, and our shipping records. Uh, the point I want to make in, in, in that slide here is uh, that not all batteries are created equal. And with that, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it, it never ceases to amaze me the depth of talent, education, and experience that we bring to the table here at the Airline Pilots Association, and more specifically at the Air Safety Organization. Just fantastic. What a great panel. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>